Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Yes, today we'll combine brains and food, and it fits together quite nicely. So, as a food trend researcher, I'd like to travel with you to the future, but I'd like to start with Claire Preston. I don't know if you realize she wrote this lovely book on bees, which I really thought was opening my mind. It was really mind-blowing. And she quotes um, Claude Levi-Strauss, uh, not Levi-Strauss, the genes maker, Levi-Strauss, the ethnologist. And um, he, he places the bee and the honey between nature and culture. And, uh, okay, what other animal would we put there? And I was wondering why, and it's got to do with the definition of cooking. He's saying that raw food, just to eat raw food, like a cow on the meadow, this is nature. But if you take food and if you convert it into something more domesticated, then it's culture. So the bee is moving in direction culture. She is not nature. She's more culture than nature. And I was wondering, hmm, the bee is older than we as humans are. And I wondered, when did we start cooking? Because if I understand Levi Strauss right, it's the bees are really cooks. They are for, for aging nectar and converting it with chemicals, with enzymes, and with thermal processes to honey. So bees are cooks. So I was wondering, uh, are we cooks? And when did the human race become cooks? And so I brought you a picture I like very much. And it's a skeleton of an, <laughs> of an ancestor of us. It's quite famous. It's Lucy, a female, not as high as we were, but she's more than three million years old. And she's an early um, species of us but she didn't cook yet. We started cooking about two million years later. So we started with the fire, not the invention of fire, but the knowledge of how to deal with it. We started about one million years ago. In some places on Earth, and it became more common about 400,000 years ago. Okay, so we became cooks. Um, but um, I like um, a wording very much a professor from the States used to say, he's saying, we are kokovore, we are the cooking apes. <laughs> so from nature, if you look at our teeth, if you look, look at our insides, we are omnivore. We can eat a broad variety of food. And the cooking helped us to get an easier access to nutrients. It was easier to get your clan, your family fed. So we became the cooking apes, and this really changed something with us. It made us develop this quite interesting brain. And it's huge. It's much bigger than the one of our ancestors. And I think it's quite interesting. It's only two or three percent of our weight. So now you can figure out how heavy your brains are. <laughs> but it needs lots of energy. It needs one fourth of our basic energy without moving, basic level. One fourth, only for the brain. And there's no brain diet. If you think very clever, it's not using more calories. If you think nothing, it's the same, okay? <laughs> but still, this is luxury. This is lots of energy. And food and cooking made it possible to become omnivore and become it easier. So cooking is quite helpful. But I wonder why did we develop this kind of big brains? And um, I'm sure there will be many answers <laughs> today. Uh, but as a food trend researcher, I'd say it's because it makes us able to think about the future. 
and think about the cons consequences of our doing. And this is home. This is our planet. It's the blue marble. It's a very famous picture. It's one of my favorites. And it's quite amazing. And let's think about it. It's blue because it's covered mainly by water. How high is the percentage the water is covering? 70. Huh? So it's quite covered by water. That makes it the blue marble. And it might, uh, <laughs> with climate change, it will grow as well. But so this leaves us with about one third of the surface being land area. And parts of it are habitable. So how much of this land do we use for uh, food production? Give it a guess from the belly. One third. One third we can use. There's, we can't make it grow. We are losing cultural land already. But it's one third. So, hmm, okay, there's still something. But now the big question is how much of this land do we use for meat, for meat production? I don't know if anyone is still willing to give a guess. It's quite shocking. It's really a lot. 80% of this, of the whole land we've got for agriculture, we use for livestock farming, and only 20% for crops. This is crazy. We are not omnivore, we are carnivore. We are really eating more meat, not all over the world, but here we are in Europe, center of Europe. So again, 80%, 20% for crops, but looking at calorie supplies, it's just the other way around. Worldwide, it's only 20% of the calories coming from all meat and milk and all the products, and 80% comes from plants. So, what I'm saying here is we are using um, the land in a very specialized way, and we are no omnivores anymore. We in Europe and some other parts of the world are eating mainly uh, meat. And this is the average of everyone in here in a lifetime. We eat in a lifetime about more than a thousand animals all through. And I like this picture very much because it's not on kilograms, which makes it very abstract. It's on animals. And this is quite impressive. But I have to say, um, we are in the middle of a change already. It's got different speeds, and we have to become faster. But this is what this day is all about, to get connected, to buzz around, and to share ideas. So if we talk about climate change, if we talk about sustainability, we have to change our food styles, the way what we eat, how we eat. But in the in the back, we would also have to focus on a changing food systems. And we are quite beginners there, but change is happening. And now I'd like to give you a short view to a couple of completely new technologies. And I think we have to open up our minds and reflect on them, not go like bad, good or bad, in a second. Give it time, think it over. I don't know if you've heard about cultured meat, um, I guess most of you have, just in two s sentences. Um, you take the cells from a living animal and you develop it in a closed system. And this picture, you see here, this was the first patty. I had the chance to take one bite, and it's now nearly 10 years ago. And um, it was a proof of concept. It was quite uh, impressively expensive by that time, but it became much cheaper. But the bite I took was from an animal which was still alive. Yeah? This is a bit spooky. And it's possible. By that time, it was the first uh, product, but it's 10 years ago, and it really developed very fast. Um, I do have a yearly report, and um, um, I was counting that um, now we do have more than 100 uh, groups doing research, and it's 
Israel, USA, and even China's got it on the five-year plan. So in vitro is really developing quite fast. It is. Um, it became the approval in December 21, and we're expecting it for the States and for Israel um, this year. Maybe due to the war, it slowed down a bit, but it's here, and this is the first product you could have in Singapore. It's chicken, it's not beef. But um, what's happening now is that it's really a big movement and millions of uh, dollars went into this new technique. Why? Because it's maybe the closest we can get to meat. And we've done this technique with plants, but now it's really um, working with meat as well. And we are doing all kinds of meat, you can imagine. We are even, we are even trying to do um, um, mammoth, mammoth meat, crazy. We are doing everything with this technology. It's not on the market easy yet, but it's in the years to come. Another thing, um, precision, precision fermentation. Um, we've got uh, quite an innovative group in Germany right now, and they use this technology to produce cheese. And it's amazing with the help of um, um, microorganism and um, once in a while with genetic engineering with the new scissors system um, but even with some techniques are without this you can make bacteria rebuild the proteins you normally only would find in the milk of a cow of a cow so if you want to do cheese or the huge variety of cheese you need this special milk the protein is is very specified, and normally it's only the cow who can do it. Our milk is something else. The milk of other animals are not, it's very art specific. So with this new precision fermentation, we can rebuild cheese without the cow, and even faster. Uh, first products you can taste. It's not on the market yet, but it's quite close. This is novel food. It will take, well, in Europe, I would say about 10 years. This is too slow. We have to become faster. But it's amazing. So there's lots of new techniques happening, reinventing food, rethinking about how to produce food. And this is something more familiar, plant-based food. This you can already found, find in the supermarkets. And plant-based food, it's not plant food. I think we really have to be very precise. It's based on plants. And I think it's a bit of magic what happened like in the last two to three years. Uh, because the plants were like reinventing them th themselves. It's really amazing uh, how close you can make a plant to the meat. Normally, a cow would eat plants and become meat. But now we take the plants and make meat out of plants without killing animals. And um, in the last years, we really did have quite a very fast development. And I just brought you one, uh, no, a couple of, of examples, but not all of them. Otherwise, I would go on for hours because they're really big choice right now. But this one became famous because it's so bloody. Um, and the, the makers tried to make it better than the original. This is, when I heard about it, I thought, this is crazy. And it's really made crazy because it is plant-based and vegan said, I'm not going to eat it because it looks too much the real thing. But <laughs> by sure, it's not for the vegans, it's for the flexitarians, right? It's for the ones which are trying to cut down on meat, but are having a hard time to have any clue what they're going to eat if they cut out the meat, because meat became so normal. And this is a, quite a new development, which I tasted a couple of months ago for the, no, a couple of weeks ago for the first time. This is a new generation before we only had like plant-based food and very small structured stuff, so you could do burgers. But now for the first time you see like steak. This is steak tips. 
and you can see in the picture it really looks quite similar and it's amazing. I think they could have fooled me. I'm not sure if I would have found out if it's the real thing or not. So this development is really going fast. This is what's happening right now. And you also can have like a normal breakfast with plants. This is not uh, the egg from the chicken. This is from the glass. And you really can do it. And this is quite a new thing also from Germany. Very impressive. So we are doing quite good. And now I've had a couple of ideas and new technologies on our search to find new solutions, what we are going to eat. And let's have a short view to insects. Hmm. Uh, first of all, uh, this picture is a bit false because we cannot replace insects. This doesn't work. But insects is quite an interesting food source. Um, not so in Europe. There is hardly any tradition. In the old days, the old Romans had delicacies with bees, which is completely forbidden. But um, in other countries, they are either delicacies or they are very cheap, basic food, because on a seasonal level, you can hunt them or gather them very easily. And insects are quite interesting. There are lots of edible spices, species, and um, they are at a very high nutritional level. Their protein is very close to ours, which makes it very, uh, very high quality. And they are rich on vitamins and minerals and even oils, unsaturated oils. So, and they grow very fast and even what they eat is very diverse. So whew, if we only would eat insects, not wild collected, but um, um, to do it in small farms, I think we could be, it could be a big solution, but food is about culture as well. But I think as Europeans, we have to keep in mind there's a big solution on this topic. So we, you can find today a couple of insects back on this wall. So please, if you haven't tasted yet, it's really neutral. It's once in a while, it's, it's a bit metallic, and these are the minerals. It's very pure. And it's really uh, impressive nutrients. And you can do everything out of it. So even this burger you can find frozen at the next supermarket in Austria. So insects are quite interesting. But what we are doing right now is we are using them as part of our system on the search to go into circular food production. Now we do have lots of specialized insects which we would feed like with food waste. And this is the very beginning, and it's, I think it's a very powerful topic as well. What else do we've got? There are lots of new sources of food. We are like right now reinventing uh, and having at the end of industrial age, we are looking on what are we able to eat. We are omnivore. So we are focusing, for example, on fungi, but what's new, I think everyone who is a fungi hunter in autumn uh, knows that there's a broader variety, it's growing at the market. But uh, from a researcher viewpoint, they realized that the mycelium is much bigger. Uh, and now they do the mycelium in closed um, boxes as well. So these fungis are growing very fast. And now the question is, is the mycelium, is this a mushroom or is it novel food? And we don't know yet. The tests are right, right now happening. And this will be quite an interesting answer. I'm, I'm really waiting to hear in a couple of months, I guess, um, because this would make it much easier to have a completely new food at a very low price level and very easy to, to have it grown. Another thought, and then I'm nearly through, but I could go on for much more because I think we really have to open up our minds. There's much more we can eat. And I like the idea of these sea vegetable gardens. It's amazing. Normally, it's more Asia, where we know there are lots of algae, micro and macro algae. But uh, also in the northern parts of, of Europe, we are 
beginners, but it's starting, and we are getting more and more aware that these vegetable gardens are very helpful to bring in new species and to make areas where the water quality is not that perfect even better. So this is a quite an interesting and very powerful topic as well. And the nutrients are also in a very big variety, and the taste is really lovely. We do have the first algae salads, and you still have to hunt them, go to the internet and find them. It's, it's amazing. It's also a very lovely topic. So, okay. So what does the future taste like? Hmm, tricky one. I'd say it will taste diverse. And I think we really have to open up our minds. There's no easy solution. Because globally, we really need a regional adapted solutions. So we need a big variety. And we have to focus on a more regenerative production methods. We are beginners on this field. And I think we really should open up to a more innovative technologies. The German-speaking cultures are very conser conservative on this field but especially the younger people, up to 30, are opening up. They are saying, OK, if it's sustainable, OK, I'll try. We need new solutions. So I think there is change happening. I'm not saying every new technique is the solution, but we need lots of rarities. And then the cultures will decide which way to go. So we need a broader spectrum of food sources, and we need to be... Um, um, more open to new products and reflect on, on their abilities for the future. So I think right now it's the best time to change food system because we are already at peak meat. In Europe it's first time since a couple of years, it's really slowly, slowly going down. It will take a long time to slow down. But we have to be more open for alternatives. And we are losing agricultural land, so we have to change. And I think um, we will have lots of good, meaning meat, in the Alps. We will have meat by sure in the far future, but less. And we will keep these animals mainly grass-fed and at a lovely quality and hopefully at another price because it's crazy how cheap it is for an animal to grow for a couple of years. And the oldest animals taste the best. So I think we've, we've lost uh, um, our way on producing meat. So we will have good meat but much less meat. We will have completely new meat, as I said, like in vitro, this is something completely new, and this will become part of our food culture. And for example, if the States or China starts with it, it will really reflect on Europe as well. So uh, dynamics will speed up. We will have all the alternative food products, what we've got now already in the supermarkets, plant-based food. Try them again. Right now they're really trying to put the prices down and the quality is not as good as it could be already. A bit tricky. Look at the internet. And more people are willing to cut down on meat completely. But this can't be the solution because we'll, it's, not, it's not for all of us. So we really have to be more open-minded and start to love plants in the huge variety, it's good for the planet. It's, if it's done nicely, it's very good for the taste. And uh, I think today you will have the chance to do lots of tasting. And I think it's very important to be more open-minded. Thank you very much and enjoy the variety of foods. <laughs> <laughs>